Hey listeners, we're nearing the end of our 15th anniversary fundraising campaign and we need your help to meet our goal. This campaign offers you a chance to win a unique food and music experience in one of the most exciting cities in America. Here's how it works. Donate to HRN and you'll be entered to win dinner for two and two tickets to a concert in one of eight amazing cities. New York, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Nashville, Las Vegas, Charleston, Ardmore, Pennsylvania, and Asheville. All donations support our work educating food system storytellers. And when you donate, you can choose one of those cities and you'll be entered to win dinner and two tickets to a show. So help us reach our goal and enter to win dinner and a show in the city of your choice. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15. Thank you. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. Heritage Radio Network is food radio supported by you. Learn more at heritageradionetwork.org. This episode is brought to you by 818 Tequila, delicious and smooth tequila, made in harmony with the earth. 818 Tequila, imported by 818 Spirits, Manhasset, New York. 40% alcohol by volume, drink responsibly. Welcome to The Great Nation, your weekly wine journey. Our guest is Alice Firing. We'll talk to Alice about her new book and, of course, natural wine and more. We'll taste, and you may have to help me here, Alice, we'll taste a... A sherry-like wine. A sherry-like wine from <laughs> Andalusia yeah. uh, for our weekly wine sip, of which Alice will tell us more about it. I'm your host, Sam Ben Ruby. Stay with us for The Great Nation on the Heritage Radio Network. We bring wine to the people. For almost three decades, Alice Firing has been the original and honest voice of natural wine. She cut her teeth on Manischewitz and mastered her way to Morgon and Barolo and a lot of other great wines. Alice is an award-winning wine writer, prolific author, publishes her natural wine newsletter, The Firing Line, and just released her, am I right, on sixth book? her sixth book, To Fall in Love, Drink This, a wine writer's memoir, a journey of love and wine from her childhood through the pandemic. Welcome back to The Great Nation, Alice. Thank you. It's great to be here again. So what's nice is we are talking to Alice face-to-face at the Heritage Radio Network Studios in Bushwick, Brooklyn. Um, Alice, you are what we call a triple crown Yes, this is your third time on the show. You came on to talk about dirt with our friend Pascaline (laughs) Le Peltier. Yes. Um, Then you came uh, on to talk about your book after that, Natural Wine for the People. And I think you and I bumped into Wild World out in Brooklyn. Do you remember that? And I said, what's going on? He said, I'm writing a book and it'll be in the... I said, let's talk about that. And I'm glad, you know, everything came through. So we're here to talk about um, your new book. Uh, but before we get into the book, I just want to pick your brain uh, on a few things. Um, I spoke to you about this off air and I hate doing it, but you know, it's you and I have you here. And I think to this day, people wrestle about what natural wine is. To your point, because you've been on three times, you've mm-hmm. probably defined it at least, you know, the three times. At least times. two other times, yeah. So I, I guess the question is, and you answered it off air. Um, the way people define natural wine, has it changed or has it evolved or it's always going to be what it is? Well, I think natural wine has evolved for better, for worse. But my definition of what natural wine is really hasn't changed at all. It starts with organic viticulture and then nothing added or taken away in the winemaking process, except maybe some extremely minimal added sulfites if needed. Some people might decide that their term for natural wine is zero, zero, no sulfur whatsoever. So 
you've talked about it. We always hear about it. You said people that farm more organically mm-hmm. and are low interventionists mm-hmm. in the cellar. And, uh, has the term organic been stretched? I mean, are people kind of screwing around with that? Well, that's been stretched for a long time. It's called sustainable. <laughs> so people but, don't use organic. They're sustainable's well, the new buzzword no, for trying to get into that I, box. I, th- I think for about 10 a decade or two, people have been using Lutra or sustainable, but organic is organic. And more and more, I think people are choosing to have certification in either organic or biodynamic viticulture just to make the statement that it's important. Is at this point, is organic, if it's practiced properly, good enough? It's a little, well, for me it is because I'm visiting these people and I see for myself. And I think that's why people follow me. And if I say it is practicing organic, they can believe me. So but that's that's an Alice thing. That's an Alice thing. If people thing. follow you and you're talking organic, you're on the ground with these people. Yeah. But what I'm saying is when... You can't really uh, you, trust it if it's not... I don't think you can really trust it if it's not actually on the label as... Is it the same thing with biodynamic or same once you thing. go to that, you could sort of school you, around you with it? Definitely no in the visit, without a doubt. So if you know what to look for. Right. So even though it's fair to say that natural wine has come more into the mainstream, people are more aware of it. More and more, yeah. The definition is, definition is the same. Right. And people are still putzing around with, with what's right or wrong about it, right? Yeah, I think a little bit less so. It's more or less, well, we can't fight them, so let's join them kind of thing because the the desire for natural wine is just so great now. So they're like not as much grousing, right. not as much, but there's still quite a bit. When you say it's so great now, it's just acceptance, more product, people committed, I mean... There's more product, uh, not necessarily all great. There's I was going to add, of, I hate to use the word consistency because that's like a crappy word for, mm-hmm. you know. There's there's a lot of problems right now with um, with quantity, availability, with um, people making wine to a certain style. And there's a lot of that. There's a lot of quick into the bottle, easy to drink, mindless wines that are around that maybe are a little sloppy. In the natural wine world. Yeah. So it's... In the new natural wine world, yeah. in, But it kind of rings to me. Tell me if I'm wrong. Like sort of this parkerization type yeah. thing in the natural, you know, where it, you're going for a style. It or, can't be avoided as much as you would like to. It just can't be avoided. It's kind of the zeitgeist you know it just there's a part there's a time when everything is beautiful everybody's in love with each other their wines are exciting and they're hard to get with your secret community right. <laughs> and then you start coming out people hey you start sharing around and then the big money comes in or the people say hey i can do this i don't have to farm i can buy grapes i can do negotiation and then people who are not so educated about what wine is or what they can it can be start just drinking it for its drinkability yeah that's... but you know it's It'll change again. I hope so. <laughs> um, this is another broad question because I think it's indicated well in the book and, you know, I think you're aware of it. I mean, natural wine goes deeper than the actual liquid in the glass. And I think you are, you know, outspoken and a proponent um, about natural wine and its effects on farming, um, the people. You forget the people, the story, and tradition, I think, is very important to you. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, we talked about organic, biodynamic. I think there's a movement towards regenerative farming. For sure. I I mean, all that's going in the right direction. Totally. Right? Um, I mean, how do we get everyone to practice? (laughs) Well, I think climate changes, or shall I say climate crisis, is going to have something to do with that. It's going to force people? It's going to force people to rethink their choices in the vineyard. Uh, They certainly won't have as much access to irrigation. People are going to have to think, well, maybe I can't grow Pinot Noir here. It's too fragile. Will 
rethink land that really should be dedicated to food instead of grapes. You know, it's we're going to so be having. So get out of the grape business. Well, it used to be back in the old days. It used days. to be fruit orchards, right? And then pulled you know, out grapes. Now they're going back, maybe. Yeah, uh, or you know, vines can grow where other other fruits and vegetables can't. Other crop can't. So you basically grew it on the hardest to grow areas. So you had your other land for food, and I think we're going to have to go back to that model at some point, or you know, polyculture grapes and food in the same vineyard, smaller vineyards. I think large vineyards are, their time may be over. Just uh, rows and rows of these. Of that monoculture. Yeah. Um, so polyculture is a fair solution? It's a fair solution. It's like guys like Nate Reddy, you know, who have animals running around and fruit and vines growing everywhere and field mm -hmm. blends. That's healthier? It certainly is healthier. Yeah. Um, I don't know how attractive that is. To a lot of people. To a lot so of people. I, you can't really farm mechanically that way. Yeah. I think in the Jura, it's not a hard sell, but I think in Napa, you're dead. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, so. Well, Napa's in for a reckoning with fires and I don't... Yeah, yeah. I mean, the West Coast. Um, the, the other part of that is the people and the tradition, which um, you talk about some great people that you meet, but the traditions, like the story in Chile... You know, how the winemaker held on to, or his family held on to right. Pais and all of that. Um, that's, that's a significant thing in natural wine. People care more about the story and where... Their heritage. Yeah. The lineage of the vines. And, yes. Do you feel the current consumer, which I guess is changing a little younger... Do you think they're more drawn towards the story and the people than just, you know, bringing a bottle out? Oh, sure. But I think even when you just bring a bottle out, no matter what you're drinking, if it has a story, right. people will resonate with it more. Even if it's a 98 point blah, 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 people want to know the story of that one. And who is telling that story? Is it them finding out on their own? Is it sommeliers? I mean, how are, how are people getting interested in wines that? Point of purchase, wherever that is, then people more and more are discovering people they like to drink and then going to visit and finding the story themselves. Or they read books. Right, which we'll get into that. I think point of purchase is important. Yes. If you have a wine store in your neighborhood that you like, I think the mission of that store is to put stuff in your hands exactly. that, you know, will make you happy. Um, you know, in the book, you talk about a lot of wine regions. You weave it into the story. Um, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and there are a lot of regions that are important to you. You know, Chile, Vermont, uh, Czechoslovakia, Italy, Georgia. Um, you've traveled to a lot of these places. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, do new things or in the back of your mind, are there any curiosities, regions or winemakers beyond, you know, what you talk about in the book and what you've written about the past years? I mean, do you have your eye? Oh, like places that I'm dying to go to? Yeah. Yeah. Like I sensed Chile was on your mind and you eventually got there. I mean, well, oddly enough, it wasn't. Um, and then once I went, I was smitten in a way that I was resistant. I knew there were a few things that I should go to discover, but I was really shocked at how moved I was by it. I kind of had the idea that I'd have that reaction to Georgia. I didn't expect it. I'm just not um, attracted to Southern Hemisphere. Um, what? Tell me the backstory of why and how you got there at all. There's a group of people who were resurrecting Pais and Pipeño. And is Pais Pipeño? Pipeño is a kind of wine, and Pais is a kind of okay. grape that is used in really farmer's wine. Pipeño okay. really, it is made in uh, uh, Pipeño in, um, in barrels of Rowley, which is the local beechwood, and it really would be the farmer's wine, and it could be red or white. What? Or rosé. What and, does beechwood impart? 
on the, I, I mean, it, we know what oath does and it's best that, it's but I mean, local. does it? It's, it's, it's pretty neutral. Okay. Because you know Budweiser's Beechwood aged. Oh God! <laughs> well, yeah, you don't want to know that. Yeah. Um, so, the idea was to carry on the tradition of Pais and the makers, and you. Well, as we think about the '80s and '90s and the early aughts, the only thing that you would see out of Chile would be Cabernet, Merlot, Chardonnay, like who cares? All these French native grapes. That and a lot actually, of bigger wine right, and very companies, big. right? You don't think about, you don't think of any campesinos, no small farmers, right. and go no. I mean, they've been making wine there since 1490. So, um, the heritage is long, deep, fascinating, and then kind of changed in the 1800s, and then Pinochet really kind of destroyed it and pulled really was not very good for the wine industry. Well, people know Pinochet as a dictator, right. but what he did was he encouraged people to make more commercial or what he thought was palatable wines. Uh, well, I mean, what, what did he do? Really put the emphasis on um, the European varieties, no association with the farmer. A lot of vines were were um, a lot of small farmers uh, lost their grapes because of planting eucalyptus and pine for the pipe paper industry. But basically he moved in and made really part of Chile's economic recovery. So there was a lot of, a lot of beautiful vineyards that were lost. Also planting those, vin those trees are not very good for vines. Ah, so it didn't work well together. I mean, ripping them out, changing them and then planting right. them was, you know, um, a whole thing. Um, but there are people down there that have sort of carried on the cause, right. right? Yes, indeed. Which is, you know, kind of interesting. All right. So you didn't answer the question. What was the question? The question was, that's an area that you travel to oh. that had a, okay. is there anything, yeah, you know, to beyond to Japan. Japan yeah. for wine yeah, that yeah. they make? Yeah. Or? yeah. Dying to go to Japan. Hopefully we'll do that in 2020. But where are they making wine? I mean, they're, just set me all up. Over. But mostly the most successful place right now is Hokkaido, which is the island the famous oysters come from. Um, oh, yeah. So north of Japan. And it's warmer there. And they can actually grow vinifera. Not that. And so there's mostly vinifera, some hybrids. But other places in Japan, they're making some very interesting wine from hybrids. So. Like Vermont. Is there a history of grapes there? there is from that... maybe the 1800s. Kyosho is really the famous grape. Um, but, um, you know, I think maybe they can do better than that. Okay, so we'll keep an eye on that. That's not where they're growing rice for sake, is it? No. Different area? Different areas. Okay. Um, so Japan caught me by surprise on that one. Right. Um, anything else? I need to go back to Greece. I've only been once. And there's just so much happening there right now. Uh, eventually, I'd like to go to Armenia. Birthplace of wine, do they say that? Well, or not necessarily? It's debatable. Georgia? Or where? You know, at one point, when Noah landed his ark on Mount Ararat, and the first grapevine supposedly sprang forth, it was one region. So let them all battle out who, <laughs> you know, who's the first one. But that area is the birthplace. The thing about Georgia that attracts me is that it really has 8,000 years of an unbroken tradition yeah. and others did break the tradition. So that is quite cool to me. Right. So it's... they get the, you know, the crown for that. So back to Greece, what's going on there? They're making more wine. Good people are making wine. They're making more reds. Let's, yeah, I mean, they're basically did, why is it on claiming their own tradition? So I was there for the first and only time in 1999, I think. And, there were still some interesting wines then. And then all this EU money came and the EU money for wineries really destroyed a lot of uh, tradition and traditional ways of making wine because, of course, new wine, new new technology, new, new grapevines. So all of a sudden, by 2004, everything was Cabernet and Merlot and Pinot Noir. You in know, Greece? So, in Greece. And so now in the past eight years, thanks to actually some importers who are really pushing people to go back to their tradition. There's a lot, there's a 
there's a reinvestment in indigenous grape varieties. It almost sounds like the Pinochet thing. Yeah. You know, where they were yeah. doing what they were doing, and then EU came in and said, here's money to do otherwise. Yeah, only it was a little bit more nefarious with Pinochet. Yeah, I mean, well, pe- we, people we, had more free will in Greece. We give them that. <laughs> we give them that. They didn't have really free will in Chile. So in Greece, what's happening? Are they starting to plant more varieties? Yes. You know, people know Greece as Astrocherco, yes. white wines. Right. They're starting to make nice reds. Oh, some very nice reds. What? Tell me some of the prominent grapes that... Um, I always mess up pronouncing uh, Simonavro, <laughs> um, which is up in the north. Quite one of the most interesting grapes for me there. What? I, it's, uh, I, I hate you know, to I find it a What do you bit. equate it to? I've, well, everybody tells me no, but um, some people say it's Grenache. Um, I think it's very San Bertino like It's got high, a lot of tannin, high acid. Mm. It's a, Spell it's, it for me. Ha, huh, X I C N A N A R V R O. You're asking somebody dyslexic to spell. So I, are you really dyslexic? I am. <laughs> You're right. Um, I will look it up. Okay. Yeah. And I will uh, check everything. Um, cause one of the things we do is we post wines. We talk about when okay. we do the wine list, we're going to post all that. Um, I'm curious your take on the world right now, the wine world. You know, I did shows before the pandemic, during the pandemic mm-hmm. and during the pandemic, everything shifted towards issues more than wine. I think a lot of things, I mean, has has the world changed because of the pandemic? The wine world, to me, whether it's in restaurants, retail, natural people's habits, I mean, have you seen any noticeable, you know, changes in the, is it different or it just took that break and came back to what it was? Well, there's certain things that are not the way it was. There's all just... Um you know, housekeeping stuff. A lot of distributors are having a lot of problems with supply. Uh, there's a lot of problems with warehouses and breakage. And there's the actual mechanism of the wine world is not very smooth right now. Uh, but other stuff. So that's post product. That's shipping, delivery, mm-hmm. you know, product yeah. and all. Oh, that. but even product, I mean, it's hard to get bottles. The, there's some some things are showing up on the on the shelves in in pet nut bottle or pet nut in a you know, well actually in a pet nut bottle because they couldn't get any bottles and that's what they had so bottles in some areas is really difficult. So two things to bottles. There has been a bottle shortage, right? And then everyone's yeah. up in arms about right. you know bottles yeah. as far as not yeah. being yeah. But as far as the culture. Um, I'm not so sure. I really, I really don't know how to answer that. Our people, people seem very happy to go out. So I think where people had been drinking a lot of good bottles at home, they're back out spending money in bars and restaurants. Uh, people are traveling again, even yeah. though with the price of plane tickets these days, it's a little bit difficult. And the aggravation that goes with yeah. flying. And tastings <clears throat> are coming back. Uh, trade tastings and public yeah. tastings. But I agree. I think like a lot of people, and I'm not the only one that I, people keep on telling me I'm not the only one, that there's a sort of um, agoraphobia that set in during the pandemic. And you think, do you really want to come out? Do I really want to, that's not even COVID. Do I really want to see people? And, you know, do I really want to have a superficial engagement that you have? And I think uh, even though people are going out, I think there's a lot of social awkwardness these days. That's interesting. That's an interesting take. Um, it's funny because through the years of the pandemic, people talked about getting back to normal. And what you described is somewhat getting there, traveling, mm-hmm. going out to eat, tastings, you know, whether it's you and I going to a trade or, you know, a paid mm-hmm. tasting or whatever. Yeah, but it's still always underlying but, fear. I had a book party last week, and it was like, is anybody going to get sick from this? Am I going to be responsible for a spreading event? And right. then you're like, oh, but I'm going to go ahead. We're all adults. We know we take that risk on. 
but it's like a certain level of anxiety that's still there. Yeah, I don't think we're we're away from that. No. Um, and they talk about how things may escalate in the fall, but let's not get into that. Um, what about winemakers? I mean, did the pandemic shut them down? I know a lot of people you know, did a lot of direct to consumer in the States. No, nobody what? got shut down. There are a few people who kill themselves, um, <laughs> that, you know, don't, which was extremely upsetting. Um, but, um, you know, it seemed pretty dire for a while, especially right. hitting, you know, with more hail, more, you know, people who winemakers who lost their sense of smell and taste and went down a really bad rabbit hole, but I don't know anybody who went out of business. So that was a good thing. But you brought up two things. You brought up effects of COVID, smell, taste, and you brought up climate, mm -hmm. what'd you call it? Crisis. Crisis, which I agree, which is hail, cold, fires, and all that. Yeah. So Drought. that that was a thorn in everyone's side or beyond a thorn as much as anything else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, that's a whole separate show. Yes. Alice, you and I could sit down and, you know, talk about the effects of that. Um, we're going to take a quick break. We're talking to Alice Firing. Um, Alice just wrote a new book, her sixth book. And I want to get into that because it is the most interesting, unusual and terrific book. And I want Alice to talk about it. Um, you're listening to The Grape Nation on the Heritage Radio Network. We'll be right back. Presatura, an Italian noun that means a studied carelessness. Picture this, woven basket in hand at the farmer's market, shocked oysters, ripe tomatoes, rapini, crusty bread, and a perfectly chilled bottle of pet nat. Cutting light lacks to set the tone, red lipsticks, friends arrive, table is set, slow dance under the sun, barefoot on the grass, a cheeky smirk while lighting up a cigarette. Apron comes off, inhibitions do as well. Hello, friends at Grape Nation. I am Mariana Velázquez, author of Colombiana the Cookbook, and I created a line of hosting where Casa Velázquez, as an extension of my life, inviting you to fully embrace your imperfect, unbridled self. Come with me to casavelázquez.co and reimagine your hosting essentials so we can set the tone for your table and home. Casa Velázquez is a mutual supporter of Heritage Radio Network. I'm Chava Peribán, co-host of Agave Road Trip on HRN, here to talk about 818 Tequila. 818 creates their tequila using traditional methods that a family-owned and operate distillery in Jalisco, Mexico. From the blue agave they grow to their recycled glass bottle, 818 emphasizes the Earth's importance in all they do. Their distillery runs on biomass and solar power, which means they don't rely as much on fossil fuels and are able to reduce their carbon footprint. Their labels, corks, and boxes are all certified by the Forest Stewardship Council as coming from sustainability-managed forests. 818 is a proud member of 1% for the Planet, through which they support HRN as well as Sacred, my organization in Jalisco, where together we transform agave byproducts and water waste into adobe bricks that are donated to local infrastructure projects, like a local library in Zapotitlan de Vadillo. Visit drink818.com to learn more about their sustainability efforts and find 818 near you. 818 has been part of so many magical nights for me, and I hope you enjoy it as much as I do. 818 Tequila, imported by 818 Spirits, Manhasset, New York. 40% alcohol by volume, drink responsibly. All right, we're back. We're back with my guest, Alice Firing. Let's talk about your new book. Okay. Um, one of, like I said earlier, one of the best things I did was bump into you at a wine tasting and you told me that you had a book coming out and I kind of kept that on uh, the back of my mind, but kudos to your people because mm -hmm. unsolicited, they reached out. Mm -hmm. I think it was Helen. It was Helen. Yeah. I mean, Helen's terrific. So kudos to her. And when all that was put together, I'm like, yeah, what I didn't expect was this book. Right. <laughs> this I mean is, you know, so the book is called to fall in love, drink this. Now, 
You've written books about the parkerization of wine. You've written books about dirt. Obviously, you know, you're a very prolific natural wine writer. Um, but this is a memoir. Mm -hmm. A memoir wrapped around wine, wine, around, wine wrapped around the memoir. We'll get to that in a second. Why a memoir? Why now? Well, at the beginning of the lockdown of 2020, I wrote a piece in New York Magazine about drinking alone during the quarantine. And my agent reading it said, I want a book of essays. And I was like, okay, well, I've always written essays. It's a dream to have a book of essays. And the only way that I could think of to do a narrative arc was through memoir. And uh, so that's the way, you know, it was, I was alone. I had a lot of time, which is actually a writer's dream, right? So I got to work on it because it really, I'd always wanted to do it, though I didn't think I'd be writing a memoir. So the idea, which you've written essay tech pieces, was to do a book mm -hmm. and you organized it by let me do it in memoir fashion. Yes. So each in essay the, would be. So I picked. Yeah, I, I don't think that I had the most interesting life, though other people seem to disagree with me. But to me, it's like, it's not that interesting. Trust me. But there are stories within my life that are, I think are stories worth telling that uh, I So can... I'm going to disagree with you. Okay. I'm going to disagree that you had a very interesting life. I understand why, you know, grow up in, growing up in Long Island, being a servant Jew, all that. But, but it, it, that's not normal well, either. If I told my story in just a regular memoir fashion, it's like there's no story there. All <laughs> right, so, to, but here I could pick some stories that I think are relatable. I mean, that, that I want, even if nobody, people didn't have some of the experiences, I was hoping that I could use my life as a way to engage people to maybe reflect on their own and see maybe how wine can, you know, um, interact with it. All right. So I have two questions. The first one is, is there anything in your life that you couldn't get into the book or left out or oh, struggled? Loads of things. <laughs> Um, well, because I just because I'm so familiar with the book, and this will pique people to get like what? Like well, what well, for it, example, like people are going in a memoir. People, ex what kind of stuff do they expect? You know, your great loves, whatever. Well, we're going to talk lot, about that. You know, there's but, a lot that I just didn't think was anybody's business, nor do I think would be very interesting to someone else. Of course, everything is in the telling. Interesting is one thing. Anybody's business. Right. Once you commit to this, you're all in or you're not. I know. So and the, if you're not, people don't give a crap. So the thing about Stephen, one of my, well, my first love, I mean, it was, that was the story of first love of meeting and then somebody who didn't drink. And that seemed to have a place in this book. Obvious. How old were you when you were with Stephen? Uh, 24. And 24 you were 30. just moving towards writing about writing. wine well, and just drinking drink. yeah i'm still a dance therapist i wasn't and, the, and i was right. writing for myself were you in massachusetts then yes. or are you um yes, yes. and he wasn't interested in sharing that experience because he didn't drink right he didn't drink <laughs> what what effect did that have on the arc <laughs> well the takeaway from that is that he did try to compromise and i think that it's i think anybody who has this rigid notion that they could not fall in love, they could not partner with anybody who didn't share something that was core to them. I mean, that's basically what that story is about and how you resolve that. There were other things that made that relationship not succeed. It wasn't about the wine. No, no. I, and yeah. I think I made that clear in that. But I think in my in my youth, and it was this, <laughs> in my 24, by the time we're by 27 year old self it was so important and so silly to be that important but you know it, it was an important this in a subtle way shows my development as a wine writer and who I became and that first I mean how could not that first trip to Paris be anything but explosive right 
Um, let's go backwards for a second. Sure. Because um, I'm curious how you even got to that point. You, you know, you have this interesting story. <laughs> well, you have this interesting story. You know, it's very personal. It's very Jewish very to Jewish. me. You know, it's that kind of weaves in there. Um, it's loaded with surprises and it's informative. You know, I think it's personal and informative with the wine. Um, bunch of questions to that. You, you talk about these essays, which are your memoir, mm -hmm. but you also relate and introduce wines to each one. And mm -hmm. I asked you this off air. Um, did the stories trigger the selections or you looked at a selection and said, OK, this will lead to the story? I mean, how did you... Yeah, as I, I said in the, um, as basically a disclaimer that the wines in this book are not necessarily my absolute favorite or, you know, these are the 15 drinks you have to drink. I don't think you ever no, set it up that way. No, but actually, no, no, I didn't. In fact, I said it's not. It's just as they relate to the story. So the story came first and the wines came in many times, I mean, in many instances, really later on, like in the third draft, I said, oh, damn, like I still don't have a wine for that. And you have to go back, read, and and just intuit what would thematically work with. And of course, every wine that I did pull out does have a special meaning to me. Right. There's not just a random wine. Oh, well, this is going to fit. Yeah, no, it's very much a wine that I have a personal connection to or a personal story to. That is very evident, but some of the wines related to the story so deeply, and I wouldn't say peripherally, but others were, is that a fair assessment? Like in Georgia, mm -hmm. you know, when you talk about the trip and, you know, the people that you met and the wine... It's like Jesus, you know, the whole, and then there are other things where, well, that's interesting why she picked that wine or I see it now. Is that fair? Yeah. To, you know, to say that. Um, so the book starts out where you're a teenager in Long Island in what I would fairly say is a dysfunctional family. Yes. Very much so. uh, Jewish, a lot of Jews in New York and in the world, but observant, which means, you know, you were religious. Or at least my mother. <laughs> your mother, right. Because yeah. your dad and you have to read the book to understand, yeah. you know, everybody. What I'm trying to figure out, and this is why I said I want to go backwards, is is there anything there that pointed you towards a career in wine? I mean, is that just a different life and coincidence? Or is there something there which... Freudian, you look back and go, well, I will write about wine because of... Well, the very first story that I set it up was my grandfather really teaching me how to smell. And so I think, you know, it's the chicken or the egg kind of thing. I think that he saw that I smelled everything, so we just smelled together uh, was kind of our language. So looking back, I realized only by writing this book did I realize that he really gave me world-class nose training. At but smelling not necessarily related to wine. No. Just heightening no, that no, sense, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. It was really my sense of smell that always led me to wine. And so there's nothing in my background, as I say, <laughs> you know, like my mother has, this is what you do for a living. You write about wine. You know, like she hated it, hated that I wrote about wine. It was really an embarrassment to her. So your mom is... Your whole family is important to you, and it's hard to sit here and do an interview and get into each character. But your mom is, you know, that typical edgy Jewish, mm. you know, I, there's mm -hmm. a million other, you know, adjectives and all of that. Did she ever look at you and say, ah, you're doing what you love. You're making a living. I read some of this stuff. It's, I mean, did it ever come to that? No, she did like reading my work. She did? Uh Cr yes. critical good or bad she way was, she used to be quite good at uh, qu quite a good editor actually yeah um did it inspire her or motivate her to no be in nothing <laughs> that was a quick no <laughs> no she really thought that it was even she wanted me to write other things like Anything but that was a shrug. That, <laughs> like write a letter to a guy in med school. <laughs> so why, well, 
you know, she, she liked when I was writing plays. She liked that. Right. And ironically, your interest, not interest, you studied dance mm -hmm. and what else? Literature, music. Right. So the literature and music kind of was a good segue, but, you know, dance was sort of a prominent thing. So the whole thing is interesting. And like I said, there it's so rich how you talk about your mom and, you know, the influences of your dad, which wants me to get into some specific stuff. I mm -hmm. talked about how you grew up on Long Island, you know, with a crazy family, had some impact on what you did. Your dad and mom divorced when you were young. You mm -hmm. had a relationship with both. Mm -hmm. Your mom typically was always dishing on your dad, but you liked your dad and spent time. There's a remarkable story and take it wherever you want and I'll set it up. Your dad went in to get a haircut. He schlepped you along. When he sat in the chair, you walked out, found a bookstore. You met a guy. Mm -hmm. How old were you? Four I was 14. You met a guy. And can you take this story from what happened in the bookstore to where it ended up? Are you comfortable with yeah, that? Yeah, sure. So um, this was on St. Mark's Place. Which was the coolest place, and your dad knew it, and he wooed you there. Right. And... Uh, so I'm, I'm in the existential section of the bookstore <laughs> up on the second, it was the East side bookstore. And, uh, this tall, lanky guy leans in and says, Camus, eh? And I try to get away from him. I went down, paid for the book, try to get out. He followed me. I was awkward. I didn't know how to get away from him. It was a little bit too um, too shy to show that I didn't trust him. And so I said, well, you know, no harm in taking a walk. I said, okay, no time to take a walk. So walking around, you know, talking. He's Jewish. I'm Jewish. He told me his name was John Berger. I intuited he was a Jew. He was not. <laughs> you know, Fillmore told me who he went to see at Fillmore as we passed You the were Fillmore. by the Fillmore, yeah. right? Second and, then, and seventh or yeah. wherever the Fillmore. And he's telling me he's at NYU. Roman Polanski is his professor. <laughs> that was before, that was a few months before the massacre. Are you getting interested or you're still thinking, how do I get out of here? I'm just thinking, well, maybe my first instinct was wrong and okay. maybe he's okay. But then he wants to take a photograph. He wants to photograph me. And then I'm like, okay. No, That's the line of the century. That is really not, no, I'm sorry. This is not happening. Yeah. I said, yeah, you want to take a photograph? Go get your cameras. No, no, no. It has to be inside, you know, lights, blah, blah, blah. I said, no, I'm not coming in your apartment. No way. What about the roof? Well, he's kind of thought, I thought, that sounds safer. It's outdoors. <laughs> it's yeah. outdoors. I mean, Silly you. You know, I was very, I was a very sheltered 14-year-old who thought that she knew everything. Um, we go up to the roof and I am relieved to see he actually has very serious photography equipment there is a cloud burst it starts to pour and he snaps into a very different personality and barks orders for me to help him take the stuff and that's how I get into his apartment he shoves a, a wad of photographs in my hand he has to go to the bathroom. I'm getting very, very spooky sense of this apartment. I got to get out. I look at the photographs. They're quite disturbing. Um, naked women's, maybe they are dead. Maybe they're not. Um, I'm out of there, but I can't get out of there. I'm at the door trying to manipulate a police lock that I had never seen. He comes out of the bathroom and while he was in there, I was thinking, you know, I don't, think that my life is in danger you know is that time I thought okay maybe he's shooting up maybe he's like right, you know mainlining whatever so and I did not I'm there at the door he comes he out he is naked from the waist down and highly erect and uh like and this is me as <laughs> if isn't this exciting <laughs> oh, and I am at the door knowing that I can't cry and I you know need to that, be strong. That I and yeah, I had the sense that if I cried, it would not be good. And I got out. I got out. You um, literally manipulated the door where, to your surprise, it opened. Right? I was shocked. I don't know how I did it. Do you think 
because we're going to fast forward to the story. Yeah. But do you think the crying would have made you vulnerable and would have changed the moment? Is that what how you, you're alluding I, I to that? I think in re that was my instinct at the time, and in retrospect, when I found out who this man was and I found out about his crimes, I knew for sure. Well. Let's move to that now. So that's a crazy story for a 14 year old whose dad just like let her roam around. And then, you know, everything you got caught up to, um, you know, that doesn't happen much today. People don't let their kids out of their sight. Helicopter right. parents don't talk to anybody. OK, so you get out of there and you obviously run back to your dad at the barbershop or wherever we take he was the up. train back home. Do you tell him any of this? No. OK. So, great story, period, end of story. No. This guy reemerges in front of you, either by way of print or TV. Take it from there. Um, about 40 years later. Okay. <laughs> 14, 40, 54, you know, you're an yeah. adult now. Okay. Yeah, um, something like that. I'm in New Orleans packing up after doing a champagne event and I see on the screen Rodney L. Callis, serial killer sentenced to death. And I recognize him and I said, but he's not, his name isn't Rodney L. Callis. He's John Berger. Now I hadn't thought about this. I don't know how I recognized him. I, I mean, this is somebody that I spent an hour with like a long time ago. So I was shocked that I even remembered that it was, and I know I had to be wrong, had to be wrong. So I was Googling and Googling and Googling all through the night until I realized that his alias was John Berger and this is who it is. And he had a moniker. He had, yes, the dating game serial killer. So he was the dating game serial killer. You see him on TV. Mm -hmm. Like you described, for some crazy reason, you recognize yeah, him. Yeah, well, actually, I may not have recognized him in other incarnations, but at that time and that trial, his hair was, even though it was all silvery and gray, it was in tight, kinky curls the way it was. He had very long, dark brown hair to his shoulder that was parted in the middle with different glasses. He had wire rim glasses uh, that were round. Here, they were rectangular but he was wearing his hair the same way, and I guess. So interesting story, but it doesn't end there. No, it doesn't. You end there. get this compulsion to do what? Well, I go to see him in Rikers Island, and then I go see him in San Quentin. Why? You describe in the book, but tell me. What... There are several, several reasons. Initially, the Rikers, I went to the trial that he was indicted to New York for several murders. I went to the trial. I just felt compelled to. Um, it's kind of like. Who was I back? Who was I? I think my um, my editor called this a never-ending coming-of-age story. And in some ways, I think that I'll probably die my last breath wondering who I was back then. Who was who is this little girl? Who, who was I before my life changed dramatically as a teenager? And it could have change very dramatically by being killed and what were my qualities that in that unspoiled 14 year old it was as if going back to see him could make me understand something about myself that is the deeper emotional reason then there are other reasons that I went the detective that I was in touch with urged me said you seem to have some sort of rapport with him maybe he can lead you to other dead bodies maybe and then he seemed well-intentioned was all his suggestions you know the, the detective oh you mean the detective? you know go was see him try to oh find no him. he was he was great oh when wendell stradford he just recently retired he was a wonderful guy he put me in touch with somebody else who survived rodney i i hate to put myself in a survivor mode because i left with no scars this woman had plenty and um but emotionally, this was the woman in California. Yeah, yeah. He's now living in Pennsylvania, and but we had similar. It she, yeah. It was just talking to her. We played the same. We played him to get out of situation. I'm not saying that others had that choice, and right. But you know, so, but 
we had similar reactions. It's very compelling what she chose to do yeah. to figure out that maybe she can get well, out of this. Was, and both of you. She could not get out the door. I could go out the door. Yeah, but she didn't get him crazy where he killed her. You know, I, I, I She can't. didn't beg him because right. begging him and crying was a trigger as right. I did deep, deep research into him and have the FBI files. I have a lot of stuff on this guy. So you could see from this book, you know... It's not your typical it, wine book, is it? No, but let's tie it back to wine for a second, because I don't want to talk more about that because the chapter, you know, mm -hmm. discusses it. But what was the wine in that chapter and how did we get to that wine? Because this is a pretty deep, mm -hmm. dark, crazy chapter. That was one of the most difficult chapters to hook a bottle to. And I probably, it was one of the latecomers because my first instinct was to leave it blank in honor of the women and men that he killed. And uh, I was not given that opportunity by my publisher. So you know, it was a little bit out of step with the others. I just followed logically. My friend Jose Pastor, the wine importer, had picked me up um, after I finished my visit with him in San Quentin. And I just picked up the story. Where we went was to the Martin Ray Vineyard in Santa Cruz. We met uh, Duncan and Nathan of Arna Roberts and to, because they're making wine from, making Pinot from that vineyard. The original, I want to say the original Martin Ray because what exists today as the Martin Ray winery has no connection. They bought the name, right. they besmirched the name. Right, he was <laughs> a very colorful. He was a very, very colorful uh, man in the wine world. And being there with Martin Ray's ghost and tasting a 1964 Pinot, which was glorious, became kind of um, about embracing life after that, which is um, it's very easy to wallow in survivor's guilt that why wasn't I killed? In fact, the memoir is going to write about it would it was why didn't he kill me? Uh, and I really have, I still have significant survivor's guilt about it. Why am I living and so many other people are dead? But I know intellectually and even on a certain emotional level that it's a waste of time. Right. It's a waste of time. Right. Um, it's interesting how you came up with that wine. There are so many stories like that. Um, I mean, you visit the concentration camps. Um, you know, there's family. Um, another interesting thing, and I don't want to just pick out certain things, but... <laughs> You know, out of nowhere, you have a friend who's a fairly well-known photographer, and next thing you know, you're sitting with an icon in music, and then you bump into a guy in jazz. Take me through that quickly. I just, you know, I, it's very cool because of who it was. Uh, yeah, so um, I was living in Boston. Stephen and I were broken up, and I, well, I'll, I'll I'll skip over. Basically, the yeah, best don't. You know, we want people to read the book. So, basically, would you like to go and hang out with Nina Simone with me next Sunday, and then take her to Symphony Hall, where she will be performing? My old friend Nina. So I'm like, hell yeah! And you know, that was an easy wine thing because, of course, I've got to bring the great Nina Simone a bottle of wine. There's going to be a party afterwards after the show. So was it in fact wine or it like, was it was in fact a sparkling wine it was you at right um it wasn't champagne because you I couldn't, couldn't afford, afford it champagne. that's right <laughs> but you that was a good choice yeah yeah it was a good choice so it really is the story about showing up I, nina was just magnificent i just could not believe i was hanging out sitting in her suite with her just chit chatting just i was just being like the young Maybe girlfriend, not quite yet. Girlfriend, Lay low. yeah. Like, what can I possibly say? They were. Um, what do I have to offer this conversation? I was highly, highly, highly self conscious. But as it turns out, uh, Nina perceived that I was Jewish. Started going on how much she loved Teddy Kolak, 
who the was mayor the of mayor Jerusalem. of Jerusalem. Right. <laughs> Do I know him? <laughs> oh, like, you're a Jew. You should know him, right? Yeah. Um, and then got it into her head that I should be her, her assistant. And, you know, so this is going on. We're very late for the show. She's an hour late. She's refusing to get dressed. She's still in her bathing suit and <laughs> robe. And her, um, you know, they keep on calling. Herb's on the phone. You know, we are, we're going to bring her. We're going to bring her. She's not moving. And then I say, Nina, what if I say yes? <laughs> what if I will become your assistant? Which, of course, I was not going to. So I kind of like, she, that kind of tricked her into a better mood. And she got dressed. And we took her an hour late to Symphony Hall. And I was behind stage and pushing her out and out to the... Um, out to Symphony Hall where she gave a very um, poorly received performance because she was uh, pretty abusive to the audience. And they were kind of, we love her, but yes, but no, but we're here. I mean, ultimately, they just adored her and didn't really make a difference. But the reviewers were very cruel Did to her. Did she get up and walk off and come back? Yeah. All kinds of stuff. Several times. Um, she, she took out, she was sitting in two mink coats. She was dripping sweat. <laughs> but she was beautiful. And, you know, and, you know, and she said, you know, you could see her. Okay, I'm going to give them what they want. You know, she start singing, I love your porgy. You know, and it was. Um, Why? And then afterwards, there was a party. Like an after party. It was an after party. With some notables. With some notables. So you bump right into back. a favorite trumpet player of mine. Right. She kind of cornered me into a, a, <laughs> the bathroom. And I, I kind of, it, there's a lot of escape in this book, you know, but yeah, quickly like ducked out of his, I remember kind of made coming a move in on for you. the kiss there. And I'm like, oops, out. <laughs> But I remember you spoke, to, I guess, Herb about it. Yeah. And I, he said, oh, that's culturally, the that's what these guys do. Yeah. You know, if oh, it's not you, world. it's the next person or exactly. whatever. You know, it's no, nothing personal. You know, nothing against you. I mean, it's just crazy, you know, it, to, to be face to face for a while with Nina Simone. And the way you put it is you're the one that stimulated her to get off her ass and get on stage. It's kind of funny. And I asked you this off air too. You never wound up working with No, her I never her did. But it was more than just, the story was more than just the story of my first, you know, my first date who took me to Nina. But it was um, how much that night influenced me about, um, about going for your art. Right. Um, Nina helped you realize yes. that? Yes. As she should, because um, I think she was as devoted or totally. her conviction. She can live life any other way. Yeah, it was her way and all yeah. of that. Um, you know, not all memoirs are about love, but I think a intertwining thread was love, you know, and your relationships. Um, and there's a handful Um I mean, do these relationships have any effect on who you are as a wine writer and how you perceive, you know, I'm, or they were, you were going on with your own life? Because basically you're sleeping, working, and you're in a relationship. <laughs> so what, you know, how did that? I didn't see encouragement. I didn't see discouragement. You know, you had a boyfriend who didn't drink. Right. You know, so um, how does love and wine intertwine in this book? I got your tongue tied. Well, a little bit. I was never intending to write about you know, my love life, and I don't think I actually did. No, and yeah. did I... Position yeah, right. it that way? No. But I mean, there are, but there is a lot of love for the characters in this book, and some were boyfriends and some weren't. My brother, um, my brother was probably the most encouraging of anybody about what I was doing. Mostly the writing, I mean, even though I think he was the real writer in the family. He was the one with the imagination, but he loved that I wrote. And, um, didn't really get any, um, you know, when I, when I committed myself to writing, my mother really treated me like a heroin addict. Like it was <laughs> like the, but so it was just the worst thing in the world. 
but so your brother, but I mean, brother. your relationship with your brother yeah, is was probably different. the most. Yeah. He, he got you when you were close right. since right. you were kids and all of that. Right. Um, so he and he's as an important a male in your life. Without a doubt, without a doubt. And, as anyone. And the other part of the love was love of wine. I mean, I meant it to be about the love of wine and how wine is, um, it can be, it's one of the greatest symbols that we can use. It's a wonderful metaphor. When, when did that really solidify and materialize? I mean, where were you? How old were you? I mean, there was a point where this is it. Oh, about writing about wine. Yeah. Where wine became primary. Well, you know, and, um, and hopefully I'm hoping that this book enables me to like move into going back to my original writing, but it finding natural wine. You know, I was writing about other things, design, wine, food. Then natural wine was I needed to tell the world about this. I needed to tell the world about wine technology and basically expose the system. Was that um, the book you did about the parkerization yes. of wine? Yeah, that was it. But the other thing is by realizing that about the wine world, that is when I started spending a lot of time in vineyards, learning a lot about viticulture, spending time with winemakers, not just at a tasting, but really spending time. And that opened up a very deep and rich world of, to go back to use the word like metaphor. So what you're saying, and it's, it's very interesting to me is, as far as wine, you're self-educated. Yes. You know, I mean, whatever you chose to read or where you right. went, but I mean, no certifications, no level one, two, three, right, right, which right. today, I mean, it's all BS now. I mean, yes. I don't know what it would do or where it would get you. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I can't see it being any other way for you. I mean, I think that's what shaped who you are. I mean, being on the ground, on the terroir, mm -hmm. with a nose in your glass, with the people. Right. Well, remember, I never wanted, I mean, I am, I'm not, you know, diminishing my wine knowledge, but I never set out to be a wine expert, right? I was a wine writer telling stories. Right. I mean, I mean you. I think Eric Asimov calls himself a wine critic. Yes. You know, he's a wine he's a writer. chief wine critic. You know, yeah. Yes. I mean, you position yourself however you want. Right. But I never, if I was going after the wine expert to be in the wine industry, and, you know, I'm wondering whether it might have been actually a really good thing for me to do just as far as being able to make a living. <laughs> but I, uh, that's the first thing I thought of. It's like, you know, in so seconds, yeah. is that where she's going? But that's not yeah, a conviction but, thing. But I was a writer first. Yeah, that's not a conviction right. thing. And, you know, if you read the book, you realize, you know, where everything comes from. Um, are you already looking forward on other projects or or you got to get mm. through this book? Well, I have to get through this, but I've started a novel and we'll see where it goes. Is it related to wine? It is. Okay. So we'll have to stay in touch on that. Um I think one of the other great things, I mean, the things that impressed me the most in the book was your relationship with your brother, mm -hmm. which you talked about a little and, you know, how he had such a positive effect on you. But I also think what shaped you was, as you mentioned, your relationship, you know, with winemakers. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are the people that really solidified, you know, how you thought about wine, what you liked. Like in Georgia. Right. Um, I think her, a woman winemaker, was it Lamara? No, she's a home winemaker, yeah. She's a home winemaker. But wine she's maker. really the keeper of the homeopathic secrets of Georgia. Explain what that means. Basically, she's an herbalist. Ah, but not a commercial winemaker. No. But you're very, you love Georgian wines. I, I mean, do. the tradition and all I do. of that. Um, is it because the tradition and the practices and the stories? Well, I love the taste. Okay. <laughs> and I love the country. And I love the country because they're, you know, the stories, the tradition, the people, they're um, chaotic and very emotional. Uh, not like other places. Right. Um, 
before we get to our wine list, you know, I want to kind of match that up to something a little closer. I mean, Georgia is far away. It has, what do you say, an 8,000 year tradition of winemaking. Yeah. Um, let's look north to Vermont. Yes. To a woman named Deirdre Heakin, mm -hmm. who basically turned wine and winemaking or either turned it on or turned it upside down. Um, are there parallels, you know, to what she does and, you know, some of these winemakers like the woman in Georgia? Uh, well, you're talking about a very, very old tradition and a very, very new tradition. Right. And there, I don't think there's necessarily parallels there except the way that Deidre and Caleb live their life so authentically where they they grow with they eat what they grow and that the way that they started making wine came out very organically from that one foot in front of the other but where it is similar the best wines of Georgia are the ones that are not imitating coming from somewhere else and the thing that I adore about what Deidre's doing and what the new wine scene in Vermont is doing is that they are not trying to make wine in a different style, like imitate a style, imitate a region. They are just trying to find out what Vermont is and, and it shows the wines. The grapes. I don't yeah. know if indigenous is the right word. But well, it's ones it, that work there because they don't, you know, the indigenous grapes are the wild grapes. Right, that are all it's over a the place. tough climate. It, yeah, so it's the hybrids and finding out which wor what works. Um, and she's working with some interesting varieties. Totally. Um, you're going to have to help me get her on the show. I've been chasing her for Oh, I years. thought she was. No, she, you know, she's tough to pin down. I mean, she's always agreed, but I just can't, you know, set it up. So that's your homework assignment, but I'll okay. follow up with you. All right. There's so much more to talk about in the book. Like I said, it's a memoir. Each chapter is a progressive story in your life. Um, you, it's crazy in a good way where all this goes. It's a, like I said, it's a very rich personal story and I don't know if I did any justice to it, but I highly recommend it cause it's, you know, super interesting. Um, the book is called to fall in love. Um, drink this. Um, and it came out, yesterday came out yesterday August and 9th. go to your local bookseller sure. and if you're in the middle of nowhere if you have to go to amazon or whatever yeah. all right <laughs> so alice we don't let anybody leave here without doing our wine list okay. you i peg you as having a very good memory based on discussions but you kind of forgot about this thing so yeah. i want to ask you the same five questions i've asked you before okay and i will do some comparison <laughs> The nice thing is our listeners love to hear what, not people like you, but people that are so committed and embedded in this, you know, mm -hmm. what are you drinking? What are you thinking? And all that. So five questions, same five questions from day one of the show. First question is, what are you drinking now? What's in your fridge? What are you oh, tasting? Not I'm drinking right no, we're going to talk about that. Several. What's piquing your interest? Seasonal changes? Oh, what's in my fridge right now is an open in a bottle of um, Domaine de la Pierre um, Muscadet. Muscadet. Um, and it's been open for a couple of days. Last night I had the most delicious Christian de Cru 2019 Equis, which is a Gamay Rosé. Even though it says red wine on it, it was delicious. Wow. Um, I am actually, even though I brought it here, I am drinking a lot of this. This is in my fridge. Um, that particular wine that particular or sherry one. type wine? This particular one. Okay. I keep on buying it before it gets... Okay, we're going to talk about that. Two, two more wines? Yeah, um, yeah, I'm not rushing. Wait, uh, wait, wait, wait. What am I... God, I can't... Oh, there was a delicious, delicious bottle of Vermont wine from... It's not commercially available. Lilith Wines, Anna Travers. Look for her very Lilith good. is the name of the winery, yes. and yeah. Anna Travers is it, the winemaker. Yeah, it's prior. not commercially available yet. It was Marquette. Um, just so drinkable. Red wine with really no tannin. You could drink, so you could drink it really cold. So a chillable red, very chillable. lower alcohol? 
Yes. Okay. And at some point, that's going to make its way out into the world, you think? Yeah, but very little. But she's going to be a good talent. Well, if really anyone cares, talent. They'll, they'll seek exactly. it out. Exactly. You know. Um, all right. All good answers. And I post your answers because I think people are interested in uh, maybe trying these wines or trying to find them. All right. Goofiest question of the pack interested in comparing it to your other ones favorite wine and food pairing not what you think is the ultimate pairing but and obviously you don't eat it every week every month but what's alice's this wine and this food is just okay um a skin contact georgian maybe even ricazzatelli which is a little bit more full bodied with a potato dosa potato dosa is indian mm -hmm. it's potato filling a lot of like mustard seeds cilantro a lot of you know kind of but does it have know, a uh, is sauce. it like a crepe lock or something where it has a it's very papery chick fermented chickpea okay. dough very very thin crepe right um but it's really the filling and that type of wine just yeah. interesting. I could tell you nobody has ever given me that one before. <laughs> um, that's a good one. All right. Third question. I don't know how much you get out. I know we all go to tastings and meet friends. But do you have favorite wine bars or restaurants? And I put that in the context of a place you would go to where you know the list is what you want people are knowledgeable about it you go in there and the vibe is fine um, are there any places let's stay in new york through your travels that you know express all in new of york them? anywhere i thought make it easy for you in new york but yeah, you can tell me anywhere good. paris is i don't care yeah new york is good um well actually i just went to a great one in vienna where i probably picked up covid um it was fabulous rundbar r-u-n-d uh, follow them on Instagram. If next time you're in What's Vienna, the name of it? Rund Bar. R-U-N-D? B-A-R. B-A-R. Rund Bar. Were Just, you at Character? Yeah. Okay. So you were in that whole Austria. Vienna. Well, not. I was, I dipped in and out of it. But yes, it's, that is a great, perfect, exactly what you want in a wine bar. Okay. Here, How about here? In New York, it's not a wine bar, but why not? Uh, the oh, newly wine bar restaurant. The newly opened chambers, our friend Pascaline Le Peltier, yes. um, that, is one of the most beautiful little wine lists in New York, and there's plenty by the glass. I agree. I can't think of anybody. A new one that I'm going to um, near me is Gem Wine Bar. I love Gem. Food and wine. Food and they wine. Supposedly, supposedly. I love hanging out there. It's like a little Italian in a teca with long tables. I mean, just it's it is uh, where I usually bump into a lot of people I know elsewhere. There I don't. Oh, and, really? I love, and I love skin contact. It's egalitarian. You can always find something inexpensive. If you, you can eat, you can actually eat and drink without spending a fortune, which I so appreciate. <laughs> and of course, 10 bells. Um, yeah. 10 bells is one of the OGs. And not, let's not forget Sammy and Susu. Also another tiny. Is that on the Lower together. East Side? On Orchard Street. Yeah. I mean, there's great wine opportunities. Right. Um, Peoples, the guys from Wild Air are mm -hmm. in the Essex market. Interesting. All right, so I'm going to post those. Those are great ones. Fourth question, favorite all-time wine. I always tell people when I originally asked this question, I was trying to get out of Alice. Hey, what's the rarest, most expensive wine you ever drank? I can give a crap about that. And I want to compare this to your other appearances. Um, what is the wine that had the biggest impact, impression, gateway, unforgettable. What's that wine? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think you're going to say... I'm going to say the one that I've said before. I think... Because it was one. There are two. Go yeah. ahead first. First one is a 1968 Giovanni Scanavino that I had in 1980. Okay. Uh, which is the wine that showed me that... And that wine is in the book, which is the wine that showed me that... It's very different than just a bottle. 
you know, that this is uh, something profound. And the other one you that- You knew that right away. With, yeah, changed my life. And the other is? The other that changed my life again was in 1998, Claude Rochebanchko. I knew that. <laughs> um, you did say that last time. Uh -huh. um, I end other shows and talking to you. I know that was important. I drank a bunch of those wines. And then my friend Patrick Capiello, who I guess through Pearl and Ash mm -hmm. and through Rimmel, had a collection and did a tasting over right. Daniel Eddy's winner. And I really got to taste like 11, 12 wines. Yeah. So it really, the wines are unbelievable. It's very sad they're not around. Um, all right, last question. And I think through your research, travel, studies, tastings, you should be able to capably handle this question. So I asked the question, recommend to me best wine around 15, 20, 22 bucks um, I always say my kids are in their late twenties, early thirties. They can't bring crappy wines to mm -hmm. dinners or as gifts, but they can't afford 40, 50 bucks. How do you wow? Like I always say Muscadet is just a great value for yeah, wine. But it's but, kinda hard to find one under twenty these days. I, actually I think you can get twenty. So get me in that ballpark. Well, yeah. Give me you can I give mean, me category, actually, maker, all of that. Actually, um Joe Landron, if you can find the Amphibolite or La Hou. H O U X. That's going to be under twenty, and they're delicious. So for white, um, Poderi Solario makes liters of wine that are quite good. The Rosso. Um, Spell for me. P O D E R E. C E L L A R I O. Solario. Okay, with a C. Uh, get a liter. The Rosso. That will be because it's a liter. It's over twenty. But it's, I think it's like 22 or 23. It's For a great liter? Value. Yeah. yeah where, really where is that made? Is that made in? It's, it's Italian. It's, is it's, it Tuscan? It's in Northern Italian. Italy. Northern. Okay. It's in, the, I think it's around um, Monferrato, not okay. in, in Piemonte. Um, so those are good ones. Those have never come up before. And I suspect that you would be able to <laughs> give me a couple. Um, all right. And like I mentioned, we're going to post that. All right, we always end the show with a feature if I can talk people into bringing wines that reflect their tastes or mm -hmm. interests. And I wasn't trying to schnur a <laughs> bottle of wine out of you. I really wanted you to think about, mm -hmm. you know, what you're drinking and what you'd bring in. So this is that Andalusian sherry type wine. Right. Now let's get specific. Okay. Name, place. So this is a project from... Nick Africano, who is a salesperson for Jose Pastor, and he has been going to Andalusia to both Sherry and this guy that I'll tell you about and doing special bottlings. And the stuff that he's sourcing is really great. Now, this particular one is from Gomez Novato, uh, which is about inland, I think about an hour and a half, maybe longer from the Jerez Triangle, you know, like Samukar down there by the ocean, which is in that area between Samukar and Cadiz is where you're really only allowed to call it sherry. But the truth is all around that area, they made wine in the, you know, in with biological aging, with underfloor. And this is uh, equivalent to a phenol. So it's a very young sherry. It's mostly uh, Palomino with some Pedro Jimenez grapes. And so Palomino, grape varietal. Mm -hmm. And PX uh, or Pedro Jimenez. Pedro Jimenez, grape varietal. Fino style. Fino style. So it's only is, about three to four years of aging. Okay. And it does develop a floor the way Van Jean So is. floor is a, is a layer, layer of, of, yeast. of yeast that okay, kind of yeah. seals in and yeah. flavors. And it. which gives you which sort of kicks out the fruity aromas and flavors and it condenses it condenses the the structure of the wine um, the texture and it makes a wine go to more nuts and dried fruit kind of you know like spectrum and he's been organic from forever he's a very very traditional dude and I brought this one because Gomez Dovado is his own wine, but the Dorado, the 
more the Amontillado kind of wine was in the book. It's the last wine right. that I have in the book. So that's why I thought I'd bring this. Also, ever since the pandemic started, I just can't drink enough sherry. Well, you talk about that last chapter of the yeah. book where even you were questioning your taste or smell or right. whatever. And this was one wine you gravitated towards right. that you were able to. Yes. And I will say this is made in the, the traditional way. It is not fortified. So it's on Rama, not fortified. What What are the fortifications usually? Is it brandy or yeah. other? That just to make it a little. Brain alcohol. But that was yeah. something that it, it was traditionally done to stabilize it during transport ah, years back. Right. But it is not, it became law only in the 70s. Oh, really? Yeah. People okay. think, oh, Sherry's fortified. No. Yeah, I didn't realize it so was now, that So now recent. it's legal to have, to call a wine Sherry and not have it fortified. It wasn't legal for a while. All right. I'm going to take a uh, bottle shot. We'll post it. But just tick off to me. Is there a vintage year? No. All right. So just tell me again, name. Buelan. Spell. B. U. U. E. L. A. N. Buelan is the maker. That is the name that Nick is calling it. Okay. The name of the of the the winemaker and farmer is Gomez Nevado. Okay. And his daughter, I think, is taking over now. So Nick is like a negociant with yes, this. Exactly. Okay. And he's still doing this. Oh yeah, he's selling for Jose. He's and is this... making music, and he's got a little <laughs> cherry project. Sounds like he's having fun. He's having fun. Um, all right, so I will uh, post that. Um, it's a very interesting wine. Um, when I it's took dense and salty. Huh? When I took the first sip, I didn't expect like <laughs> sweetness, <laughs> but um, I expected something it's very savory so that was pretty cool um all right so we're gonna post that alice we have to wrap up the show we've run way too long let me do a quick wrap up and i want to get some info from you um if you have a question suggestion wine happening or event hit me up at sam at the grape nation.com that's sam at the grape nation.com subscribe to the grape nation podcast on apple Podcasts, stitcher spotify or wherever you get your pods Leave a review if you like the podcast. Follow us on Instagram at SBenRuby, on Twitter at BenRuby. I know it's a little confusing, but if you use the hashtag The Grape Nation, you'll get to us. Um, as I mentioned, we'll post Alice's wine list, her answers, some great, you know, recos there. And our weekly wine sip. That's why I made her spell it, so I know what the hell I'm talking about. Um on all our social media sites. More importantly, Alice, the book. If we didn't pique people's interests, um, where do we get the book? We get the book. You can go to thefiringline.com and then go down to the book section and hit books. It will lead you to a variety okay. of, whole, of retailers. It's at Barnes & Nobles. It's at McNally Jackson, local booksellers. At your local bookseller, it is. Um, uh, if you want to avoid the big behemoth, you can go to indiebooks.org and find a local bookstore near you that has my book. Good advice, and don't forget when you go to Firing Line, it's F E I R I N G. So you Thank don't, you. <laughs> um, you know, screw that up. Um, and if people want to follow you on social media. Instagram, Alice.firing. Okay. And then the usual Alice firing on Twitter or Facebook. All right. And before we sign off, the firing line has been around how long? A decade. I'm a 10 decade. years old. Okay. You're just a and kid. You're, my you're not even a you're like you're mm-hmm. not even a preteen. You're almost a preteen. All right. So the firing line is a newsletter. Newsletter. Right. A paid newsletter. And it comes out how stuff. often? Every three weeks. Okay. So it's almost monthly. Um, it's a paid newsletter. And let's tickle people a little. What what were we recently writing about, Hannah? Recently writing about Burgundy. Okay. And oh, we uh, didn't talk about that much. And basically, uh, is Burgundy relevant anymore? Ah, I like, I like that whole setup. <laughs> now I got to go and read it. 
All right. So that's the firing line. Um, if you love Alice like I do, you're interested in natural wine, you're interested in good writing, um, you should take a look at the firing line and maybe become a subscriber. All right. I want to thank our guest, Alice Firing. Um, thank you to our engineer, Armin, and everyone at the Heritage Radio Network. I'm Sam Ben Ruby, and you've been listening to The Grape Nation. The Grape Nation is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. Keep in touch at heritageradionetwork.org slash subscribe.